Hello again, and welcome to Spotlight. Today we're going to be discussing a topic that most of us are not very familiar with, and um, it's going to be a topic that may be referred to as sort of a silent crisis. We're talking about the emerald ash borer, and this is a, uh, a crisis that is slowly creeping into Vermont and it's creeping throughout the northeastern part of the United States and other, other parts of the uh, country. I'm going to be joined today by Barbara Schultz, who's uh, with the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation uh, in the Springfield office. Barbara, welcome. Well, thank you. Now, I just gave a very, very brief definition of what we're going to be talking about. Now, uh, hopefully there's going to be a photo shortly of what the emerald ash borer looks like. Um, is this going to be our major concern, the, uh, the, the mature emerald ash borer, or something else we're going to be worried about? Well, the emerald ash borer is going to change the forests in Vermont. Because we have 5% of the trees in our state are, are ash trees. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of ash trees growing in our towns and along our rural roads. So emerald ash borer is going to change the state of Vermont because it kills ash trees. And um, it's, it's an insect from Asia. It's been here, or known to have been here, since 2002, which isn't very long ago. In 17 years, uh, we've learned everything we know about emerald ash borer is something that we learned in the last 17 years, uh, which is really the blink of an eye in terms of research, in terms of the health of the trees. But in that very short time, emerald ash borer has spread from Michigan, where it was first detected in the, in the United States, and it was also detected in nearby Canada in 2002. Um, it's spread from there to way th over 35 states. Um, it, it's probably 35, 36 states now that it's spread to. Okay, now why, why are we really concerned about this? You mentioned the, um, it attacks the ash tree. Uh, first of all, how many ash trees do we have? Like I said, five, about 5% five of, the, of the trees in the state of Vermont are ash trees. Um, it, it goes, it's unevenly distributed in, through the state. We have three species of ash in our, in our state that are native to Vermont. Um, and uh, different species are more common in different parts of the state. And here in, in Ludlow and in southeastern Vermont in general, we have the white ash, and we have an ash tree um, on the showing right now. That's a young white ash tree. Um, if, when it grows to a larger size, uh, it's probably a little more distinctive here. That's the diamond-shaped bark on an ash tree. Mm -hmm. um, there, and it gets those deep diamond-shaped fissures, which is how you could recognize it. And if we have the leaves, they, you can see uh, ash has what we call a compound leaf. So instead of the little oval shapes being a single leaf, they're what we call a leaflet. And when you pull them off the stem, you get that whole leaflet at once. So uh, because it's kind of a, um, a heavy leaf, it's got a, a very thick twig as well. And the twigs and the branches are all grow off the stem opposite each other, as do the leaves. So uh, all our three species of ash have those compound leaves. They, they look quite similar. But the black ash grows a little more in the northeastern part, northeastern part of Vermont. The green ash may be more in the Champlain Valley. And right around here, we have more white ash. Um, OK, well, what we have right now is a picture of where the, the, uh, the ashes have actually, the mm -hmm. emerald ash borer has been spotted. Yeah, so let's talk about this map for a minute. Um, emerald ash borer was first detected in 2018, about a year and a half ago now in February. Um, a consulting forester brought it to our attention. We really like people to be on the lookout for this insect, and I'll probably say that a few more times. I appreciate folks uh, paying attention. But this was called in. He had, was familiar with the emerald ash borer, what it, the symptoms look like. And that big, the biggest blotch there that, that covers parts of uh, Washington, Orange, and Caledonia counties um, was, was where it was first detected in the state. But it didn't take too long before uh, those other five areas showed up as well. Um, so, so now we have five areas within the state where we know emerald ash borer occurs. Okay, now we also have uh, the uh, budding states, uh, mm -hmm. New Hampshire, Massachusetts, yeah. and yeah. New York, yeah. plus the province of uh, Quebec. Sure, yeah, and in this area, the one that may have, be of more concern than any is just about 10 miles east of Vermont, just across the Connecticut River from Windsor. So just over 10 miles away from Vermont, but enough to be a, a threat, and maybe it'll come from there first. Okay, now, we're concerned about this, but why are we 
specifically concerned about the impact that the borer has. Mm -hmm. So it's a tree killer, and the way it, it kills the ash trees, um, the adult lays its eggs on the bark of ash trees. The adults have been flying. They're going to stop flying now. Egg laying is almost done. When the egg hatches, the young uh, larva, the grub of the emerald ash borer, mm -hmm. goes into the tree. Oh, could we back up and see that adult uh, while we were looking at it? There you go. That, that is the adult emerald ash borer. It looks like a giant, but really it's only a half <laughs> inch long. And uh, the, the green color is pretty, but you may not even notice the green color because they're kind of subtle um, in the summertime. There's a little bit of purple under, underneath the wings. Um, so that, that adult um, will feed a little bit on the, on the ash leaves in the summertime. Uh, they'll mate, like I say, and then they'll, um, they'll lay eggs on the bark of the trees. Now that's about the, the, the less than the size of a penny. Yeah, right? that's right. That's a good way to remember it. So once the, the eggs have been laid, the larvae of the emerald ash borer feed between the bark and the wood primarily. And that's what you're looking in, at in this picture. It's the tunnels made by the feeding grubs. And uh, we call them S-shaped. I guess they're not all S-shaped, but they go back and forth. Um, and if you look at them closely, you'll follow one particular gallery. Um, they start small because the grub starts small. And mm -hmm. as the grub gets bigger and bigger, as you follow those S-curves down the, down the tunnel, um, the, the gallery gets wider and wider as the grub goes. It actually spends uh, the winter just underneath in the wood, then spends another summer feeding and then comes, it's a two-year life cycle, usually. So it takes two years under the bark, and then it comes out through these, these exit holes, the D-shaped exit holes. They're very characteristic of emerald ash borer, but I have to say, in light infestations, they're often hard to see, because remember, this is a tiny beetle making a tiny exit hole. That's what the adult comes out of about, the about ash About how tree. wide is that, uh, that hole? Oh, how wide is that? About That's, a quarter, yeah, a quarter inch. Three sixteenths yeah, of an inch? Yeah, yeah. So they're, they're small, and often they're in the upper part of the tree when it first starts out. Once the tree is very well infested, they're all up and down the tree. But um, so often, um, instead of seeing the, the, the signs of the insect, the insect itself, what people often see first is the woodpecker activity, because they can sense these grubs underneath the bark much better than we can. Um, that's their food. And once they start finding them under the bark, they'll keep on going back. And as they feed, they'll scrape the, um, the bark off, and we'll see a, a sort of flattened area on that diamond-shaped bark that were so characteristic of ash. So what we see often first is, is shallow woodpecker holes. Um, those big pileated woodpecker holes, that's something else. They're not looking for emerald ash borer because they're going into the wood. But the, the narrow, small uh, holes of maybe a downy woodpecker or hairy woodpecker, um, when you see pe woodpeckering all over a tree, that's, that's a cause to take another look and see uh, if it might be emerald ash borer. Okay, now there's, isn't there uh, another way you can tell if you see growth coming out mm -hmm. from the base of the tree? Yeah, so if the top starts to die, the tree won't give up and it will start putting shoots out from lower down in the tree and you might see some very long shoots coming out and that would be another uh, symptom of infestation. Okay, now uh, what's the normal history of uh, how long this takes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as I mentioned in, in Michigan, um, it wasn't identified until 2002, but it had, it had been there probably for eight or ten years before it was ever identified there. So one thing we, and that has been the truth everywhere in the North America, is that we find it after it's already been in a certain location for several years. And I think that's really important to remember, is our expectation needs to be that we're not going to find it right away and that it's probably in places we don't know. And as, as you recall that map, that map had th those, um, those circles were 10 miles in radius. And the reason for that is we consider that whole uh, area with a 10 mile radius to be likely to have some infested trees in it, uh, but the trees that we haven't found yet. So um, we want people to treat ash trees in that area as if they might be infested and that we just can't see it yet. Now, isn't there another uh, characteristic of the ash tree once it dies, is particularly a full-grown ash tree, mm -hmm. that the branches become very brittle yeah. and uh, they actually represent, uh, what, lack of a better word, a safety problem? Absolutely. That is, that is the word. They, be, they do become a hazard. And uh, so taking down an ash um, that's already gone is a much bigger risk than taking down a live, healthy ash. 
Um, so uh, municipalities in particular and utility companies that uh, really need to be sure that um, the roads stay clear and the utility lines stay clear. Um, some are making the decision to um, remove ash preemptively, especially near these areas that we know are already infested. Well, utility comes, for example, the, they have their normal right of way mm -hmm. uh, for their lines. Uh, are they actively engaged in uh, checking for uh, emerald ash? It's very important to them, as, as you mentioned, because the, it, they are so dangerous to take down once they are dead. And once and they're dead, obviously, they're a hazard to the, the utility lines and the people working in them. So they're very actively in, concerned about this. Now, yes. now, the emerald ash borer itself, the mature um, uh, insect, how far can it fly, say, from tree to tree? I mean, it's, yeah. I, 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 I know nobody's been out measuring it. Oh, you know, they do. They, they, they re original research, they tied uh, uh, insects to, glued insects to a wind tunnel and measured how far they could fly. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> they actually did. <laughs> but, of course, it's a law of average. They, tr they fly as far as they have to. So if there's another ash tree next, next to the one that they're emerging from, they'll stop right there. Okay, but so, now no, yeah. normally yeah. When, you, when you think about uh, this, I mean, can they fly in, say, in one summer um, uh, 50 miles? N not that, they, they wouldn't. Um, we say one to two miles is the normal within that range. Um, but yes, the, someone in, in this test, I think there was one that flew as far as 10. So there, you have the real champion, the marathoners out there. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that wouldn't be typical. Normally they fly as, yeah, as far as they have But isn't there another to. problem with the yeah. uh, in, uh, just distribution of firewood? Mm -hmm. Yes. So this is just so important because, as I mentioned, there's so much we don't know about emerald ash borer, and uh, we're, we're just learning a lot. And, and to the extent that we can slow the spread of this insect so that um, it doesn't cover all of Vermont in, in one fell swoop, um, the more we can do to be able to learn more about the insect, to protect the trees that we want to protect, um, to make management decisions that make sense for the landowners and the municipalities. Um, so the more we can slow the spread, the more options that ev everyone has. We're kind of all, we want everyone to be all in on the idea of slowing the spread. And what that means is for folks that are inside those, um, I call them the fried eggs, the infested areas there, um, for folks that we, we really do ask them to keep their firewood, any firewood within the infested area, not move it outside of the infested area. Um, the, like I say, the utility companies have, are very aware of it and are not moving uh, pruning material outside of those infested areas. Um, our wood industry has been very supportive of only transporting uh, logs at times of year when it's safe to transport logs. Um, so we do have a lot of cooperation and interest from people just to slow the spread of the insect and not to be part of the problem. Okay, well, I, I believe it, I saw a sign in Connecticut where they actually uh, prohibit mm -hmm. the firewood from coming out yeah. of state. Yes, yeah, so we actually also have a firewood quarantine in, in the state of Vermont. We've actually had one for longer than we know we've had emerald ash borer. And it protects us not only from emerald ash borer, but really from any non-native pest that we may not have that um, that may travel in firewood. Um, so, and there's, people bring firewood long distances. Um, so we do have a quarantine about treat, bringing in non-treated firewood into the state of Vermont. Now, isn't there a, a federal government uh, quarantine area? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there is a quarantine on emerald ash borer. Um, and it made a lot of sense when people knew a little less about emerald ash borer. Um, people thought they could slow the spread. Uh, other pe people may be familiar with this insect, Asian longhorn beetle, which kind of was detected at about the same time. And the quarantine on that has been very, very effective. There's, it's very limited spread outside of infested areas. It's really the opposite story with emerald ash borer, as a map of the uh, air infested area could show. Um, that the area that's infested by emerald ash borer is, like I said, half, basically the whole eastern United States has emerald ash borer scattered here and, and there throughout it. Okay, now uh, what can we do to uh, prevent the, uh, the, the lava from actually doing damage? Uh, is there some mm -hmm. chemical treatments that mm -hmm. can be? Uh... So in fact, there is. Um, it's a, the treatments are what we call systemic, which means they need to be injected into the tree. 
Um, and so it's a tree by tree treatment and there's nothing that really people spray on the whole tree that protects okay. the tree very effectively. Um, the, tree, the treatment needs to be done by a certified pesticide applicator. Um, so as, as I'm talking about these details, um, for people getting the impression that you just can't do this to every tree in the woods. This is something that's really appropriate for uh, special trees, uh, landscape trees in the yard and in the, in the parks that may be a particular value. Um, people are also using this treatments just to preserve, um, to preserve ash trees so that for their seeds. Uh, one thing that's important to say is that um, emerald ash borer is a tree killer, but some trees have survived. Um, it's a small number, and I can't, the, the exact number may, may be different between green ash and white ash, but there is some genetic resistance out there. We're really hoping that that's something that will protect ash trees in the future. Well, weren't there similar yeah. trees in Asia that actually have proven that they can survive mm -hmm. the uh, Well, the certainly. The, the native trees in its native area are resistant to emerald ash borer, but even our white ash has some resistance. Green ash has some resistance. Um, so if we cut every ash tree, we will never have the resistant trees surviving. So um, we're certainly not telling people when you have ash trees in a place there'll be a hazard like on a roadside, that's, one, that's a place where it really is important to be proactive. But in the woods, uh, we really encourage people to keep ash as part of the resource because if we cut every, every ash tree, we will not have ash in the future. So we need to preserve some of our seed source so that well, we can This is a matter of curiosity. Yeah. Uh, Baseball bats are normally made out of ash. Yeah, yeah. Uh, have they stopped making baseball bats out of ash? <laughs> yeah, certainly there has been some transition to, uh, to, to, I know there's a lot of maple bats out there now. And it is certainly a concern of the bat manufacturers. Well, I, I know maple yeah. is, is a hard wood, yeah, but yeah. is ash harder than, than maple? I think the concern is splintering. Is I, I'm, not, I'm not a real expert, but I think, that, <laughs> I think that's the property with maple that it, it splinters more than ash. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, who was actually trying to deal with this problem? Now, obviously, in your position uh, yeah. with, the, with the state, uh, yeah. you're interested in stopping this. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I know the federal government is involved with, with I believe it's the Department of Agriculture. Yeah. Uh, doesn't it all come back really to the locality? Sure, I think uh, people on, everyone plays a role. So our, our role, we do have great partners at the uh, Agency of Agriculture in Vermont and with the USDA as well and U.S. Forest Service. Um, and our approach is more on a, on a regional statewide level. Uh, things that we're working on are uh, working on biocontrols mm -hmm. for emerald ash borer, uh, this, this monitoring of where the insect is so people know when emerald ash borer has shown up in their community so that, and also that people can help us in this slow the spread effort. Um, and we're trying to uh, make some pr progress in uh, saving ash seed. We've done, we actually have ash seed banked from Vermont. We did that a number of years ago. And I think we want to work, um, increase our efforts in that area. Yeah, so that's, just, yeah, I just yeah, yeah. Your, this is something that never occurred to me, but there actually is a seed that is the source of a, an ash tree. There you go. I mean, uh, for some reason I always thought that yeah, yeah, the, the yeah. roots were there, and that's yeah. how they grew. Yes, yeah, so they do make seeds, and there's male ash trees and female ash trees. Oh, so saving heavens. just one isn't good enough. You got to save <laughs> one of each. <laughs> one of each. So, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now, uh, in, in terms of uh, dealing with this, obviously there's going to be a public interest in this, mm -hmm. but uh, I assume that the, the private sector's got probably just as many ash trees as the public. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Well, in Vermont, we have so much of our land is private land. So, um, and certainly the, the, our forestry community and our landowners have, are really interested and in, have been following this for a long time. Um, again, that, that map of slow the spread shows folks um, where they are relative to the insect and everyone should be thinking about it now. Emerald ash borer is something that everyone is going to have to deal with. But as you recall that, that, that map of Vermont, there's a lot of places that haven't seen emerald ash borer yet. Even in Michigan, there's plenty of places that haven't seen emerald ash borer yet. So I don't think people should be treating their trees as if they're infested when they're very far away from the infested area. Uh, landowners, uh, we do have a lot of guides on, um, there's a website, VT Invasives, uh, which is where we post all of the information about emerald ash borer. Um, so and we have quite a bit of information there and we're talking about landowners right now. 
So um, we have recommendations for landowners um, mm -hmm. and telling folks what to do on VT invasives and, and how to slow the spread if you're a landowner. Now, where could yeah. a landowner get, get these uh, so publications? So these, these publications are online, vtinvasives.org. Okay. <laughs> um, and if they, if they went to that website, they can find recommendations. We also have recommendations for homeowners that look like this. Um, so, uh, and for a variety of different people, um, it's because homeowners are going to be dealing with it, municipalities are going to be dealing with it, utilities are dealing with it, um, and of course forest landowners and the forest industry. So it's a problem that crosses many sectors in Vermont. Now once a tree has become infected, uh, are chemicals of any use? and salvaging it. Yeah, um, so one of the things that a homeowner's guide will, will explain is how to assess a tree to figure out whether it's too far gone or whether it may uh, respond to the chemical treatment. The earlier the better though because the, the chemicals require, the chemicals require um, moving sap in the tree and um, a healthier tree will move more sap. So uh, this, this shows how a systemic treatment is done. Uh, these small holes are, are drilled around the tree, and the material, uh, the insecticide, is put in a, under pressure. Now, um, who was actually doing that? That would be a certified pesticide applicator. Um, and some, uh, when, some municipalities uh, actually have treat their own trees and, and have their own equipment, and some, uh, some municipalities and homeowners hire, hire arborists to do that. Yeah. Now, if, a, if a, a town, I assume it's an expense to get somebody like that to mm -hmm. do this. Uh, could the town actually get one of, say, one of its employees or a volunteer and have them trained so mm -hmm. that they would be qualified to do yep. that treatment? Yes. Uh -huh. yes. Now, would that, would that save them some money? Uh, the, certainly the cost of the application, because it does have to be repeated until the outbreak is, is, has gone by. We don't actually know too much about what happens after the outbreak has gone by, because there's not too many places in the country that have experienced that. <laughs> but we're learning, and like I say, that's one of the reasons to really try to slow the spread. Well, yeah. How often do you, would that application be required? Um, the pesticides that we, the pesticide that we recommend um, is good for at least two years, if not more, three or four. So, um, so that that is one good thing about it. It it does provide protection for several years. Okay, and if a private in, 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 uh, individual was interested in finding out more about this, what would be the first place? He should go to VT invasives. <laughs> okay, now yes. is VT invasives going to uh, uh, tell him things like who can come and do inspect his trees? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm assuming that the the individual is like myself is totally ignorant yeah. of yeah. the uh, the subject. Yeah. So the VT invasives does have um, how to identify emerald ash borer. And it gives some lookalikes. Uh, we get a lot of calls in the spring of the year, and we're really glad to get them about green insects in general, because mm -hmm. there are other green insects out there. We're glad to get them. We really appreciate people looking. Uh, but if you wanted to check on VT invasives first to see if your green insect looks like emerald ash borer, or if it looks like one of the lookalikes, that that's a real handy for us too. Um, there is a, a, a function there, a reported function that people can just uh, click on and and the message goes to someone that can help identify the, the insect okay. and whether or not it's infestation. Now don't they have traps that you can actually mm -hmm. uh, uh, put up to see if uh, it, you can capture, uh, I assume you're capturing the mature yeah. uh, emerald borer. Yes, yeah, so we do have a network of volunteers, our forest fest first detectors, that are helping us uh, put purple traps up. Um, many people are familiar with the purple traps that um, the USDA uh, used to provide for us and were quite widespread in the state before we detected the insect. Um, now that it's here, it's more falls on our shoulders as a state to do the job. And our, we have a cadre of volunteers that are, are trained in forest pest work, the forest pest first detectors. And uh, they've been, uh, there's about 50 of them out in, in Vermont this year. Um, but I will also say that there's, for forest landowner, another thing that's on this website is how to make a girdled trap tree. Um, so a stressed tree will be more attractive to a, an emerald ash borer than a healthy tree. Okay. And if you artificially stress a tree on your property by girdling it, by, by taking away the bark around the a, a ring around the tree, it'll tr if there are emerald ash borers in the area, they will fly to that tree preferentially to all the other trees. They can sense that? They can. They, there's a chemical oh, smells God, that they get. Yeah. It's amazing so, what yeah. 
So if a landowner particularly wanted to know in more detail right about their property, uh, uh, putting in a girdle of dash tree uh, is what you could do. We do it on state lands in, near the infested areas so that we can have a heads up. Now, if you, yeah. I'm going back to my high school uh, mm -hmm. chemistry, but uh, if you do that, stressing it, cutting the bark around it, I, I remember if you wanted to kill a tree, you just had to, mm -hmm. Good heavens, I've forgotten what the name of the layer is. The, um, the phloem? I'm sorry? The phloem, the cambium. The cambium is the, the living cam cells. Cambium, yeah. 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 Uh, if you uh, cut through that yeah. all the way around, yeah. Yeah. you've essentially killed the tree. Right. Do not girdle a tree you, do, you are not willing to part with. It will die. Okay. <laughs> yes. So, so yeah. if you want to stress it, yeah. you just cut part of it. Well, we, we actually cut our girdle trap trees down. The point is, is to cut the tree down and peel it to see if the borers are there. Okay. So one wouldn't do that unless you had small trees that you were willing to part with, yes. Okay. Now, if you yeah. cut down one of these trees that has been infected, what do you do with the wood? Yeah, so if folks are within the infested area, uh, please do not move the wood outside of the infested area. That's just the most important thing. Um, but it, it, can be burned, it can be burned as firewood, ash, um, as a reputation for um, being very easy to burn. And even when it's green, it turns out ash has, uh, water moves in ash only in the outer ring or two. It's unusual in that way. So um, it does make good fire with it. That's why people like just keep it local. Keep it in if keep it near where it's cut. Don't move it very far and burn it that winter, prefer preferably before the the emerald ash borer comes out next spring. Okay. Now the one thing that I did check on was uh, the the lava that is creating all these problems. It can survive a Ver Vermont winter. Yes. Yes, it can. So the cold is not mm -hmm. going to kill it. Yeah, apparently northern Minnesota, they've been doing just fine up there. Yes, so it does survive our winters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. But apparently it does fine in the south, too. So it's it's pretty tough little bug. Okay, yeah. so how would you summarize this whole problem now in terms of what Vermonters should be doing? Mm -hmm. So there are a couple things. One is to keep an eye out for it. Be aware of what those survey maps look like. Uh, we, we've been putting out uh, news in the areas where we find emerald ash borer so that people know if we found it in their area. So do be, do be paying attention to uh, sightings of emerald ash borer. Um, know how much ash you have. If you have a woodlot, know if you have a lot of ash and if you're at risk or if it's not really going to be that important for you. If you, uh, municipalities the same way, a lot of municipalities are choosing to do ash tree surveys so they know what kind of problem they're going to have. So know how much ash you have. Um, when emerald ash borer shows up, don't slow, don't, don't speed up the spread. Uh, do your part in keeping emerald ash borer local. Um, and uh, like I said, keep an eye out for the insect. If you see anything you think might be emerald ash borer, report it. Um, that'll, that helps us and it helps you have an early idea of whether or not you have the insect. Well, I really want to thank you for coming in mm -hmm. to talk about this. This is a subject that I know most of us are totally unaware of, yeah. but it, uh, it's something that is going to happen. It's not a question of will it happen, just a question of when it's going to happen. Yeah, well, thank you for bringing it to folks' attention. Okay, yeah. well, thanks again. Thank you. And we'll call that a wrap now, and we'll see you sometime in the future.